Um, so with that, let me introduce Zoltan. So Zoltan is an assistant professor at, uh, of civil and architectural and environmental engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. And he's the director of the Intelligent Environments Laboratory since 2016. Um, he works on smart buildings and cities, renewable energy systems, control systems for uh, net zero energy buildings, and mainly in the application of machine learning for the built environment and for a sustainable energy transition. Um, he has received outstanding research awards from IBIPSA in the USA in 2022, several best paper awards in multiple conferences and building an environment journal, and also has a highest cited paper award from Applied Energy, which I believe is the reinforcement learning for demand response paper, right? Uh, yeah. Is, uh, um, uh, yeah. Uh, after his uh, PhD at ETH Zurich in the McKee department, um, he spent his postdoc years there working on the high low slash nest module. Um, and he was uh, working at EMPA. And um, Daniel Coqui at Mars was one of his collaborators at the time, who Chris and Scott, you, you guys know well. So, with that, Zoltan, please take it away. Um, I'll mute as well. And uh, welcome to the seminar. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Ankush. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for inviting. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, we'll we'll um, talk about you know my, my work. Um, we'll pick uh, this topic of CityLearn and green interactive buildings and control of demand side energy um, in, in larger communities as a topic for today. Um, before we start, I, I, I have this link at the bottom um, and then the link and every slide is on it. So you can you don't have to write it down now if you're interested. All the papers that, that I'm showing, whether it's mine or references, are in that folder. So you can download them at your convenience and read them. Um, whenever you want. Um, okay, so <clears throat> IEL, what we do uh, generally, the you know, our, our sort of like two-liner uh, is we, we looked about intelligence and human responsive in, in environment on infrastructure. We, we'd luck a lot, I would do a lot about or think a lot about how we can use data in a meaningful way um, as we go from, you know, talking about individual zones where people interact with the buildings all the way to what happens, you know, when multiple buildings interact with the power grid and then everything in between. Um, we tend to focus a little less on sort of like the building scale, one building type thing for the pure selfish reason that there's a lot of work and a lot of people working. So it's a very crowded space. So rather zone end, end up, you know, one zone control or sort of like multiple buildings, uh, many buildings together. That's kind of like where we would tend to be. Um, also, it's a lot of applied work in some sense. So a lot of the work I'll show today is more applications and then, uh, you know, not a lot of theory or, or, or mathematical developments for get you excited about the work. And then if you have, you know, questions, want to dig more into detail, we can do that at any point. Um, my point today is to, you know, make you get excited about our work and then hopefully get some, some ideas going um, in general. Okay, so why do we do what we do? I'm sure you know all of this. Uh, you know, it's getting warmer and warmer. Um, every year is the hottest on record and it doesn't really get better. Um, this is the not the latest chart, um, but but it's one of those charts from IPCC that show, okay, we it's getting very serious. And so we gotta we gotta do something, right? So what do we do? We know what we have to do, or you know, first of all, what the reason is we use a lot of electricity, mostly in buildings, or a lot of it is in buildings. And it, it's not going to go away, right? Because we will use more and more. And we know what we know what we have to do. We need to decarbonize the grid, obviously, make everything clean, and at the same time shift towards um, using electricity only and not burn fossil fuels. I personally am not a big fan of uh, you know carbon capture stuff. It just has not been proven to be something that we want to rely on so heavily as some others um, may may you know imply. So anyway, you know, what you see here, this is a study we did a while ago. Um, as you increase in the future, uh, the share of solar and, and wind, right? Your, um, oopsies, your, your uh, overall, overall um, grid will be cleaner, but because you're having mostly solar and wind, what you need is to align that generation because it's not all the time, obviously, you need to align it a little bit with the demand side. And so, so that's that's a fundamental problem that we're addressing um, from uh, you know the buildings perspective. Now, when you go into buildings, um, the DOE has provided us with sort of like a you know blueprint um, roadmap that we can look for. So, one of the approaches that we've done over the long we as a society have done right is 
become more efficient. So we use more with less energy, which works um, to some degree. The efficiency measures always have a certain um, rebound effect. As you know, with cars, they become more efficient than they are, but yet you use still more uh, energy than, than they used before because the cars got bigger, right? It's the same in buildings too. They're more efficient, but they're bigger. And so that's that's the, there's a limit to how much you can do with efficiency and how far you can take it. So then obviously we talk about you know adding solar and other sort of renewables if that are somewhat localized during the day. These are daily, typical daily profiles or something like that, right? So then you create this, this ducky curve that, that we know where you have low generation during the day or low demand during the day to the grid and then you have to ramp up in the afternoon. Um, and if you do it all at the same time, which is what California is experiencing, it just gets worse and worse over time. Like you tend to get this kind of like peaks and you have a high ramp and then a large peak at the end. And so it's not ideal. It's better than before, right? But it's not not ideal uh, the case. And so ideally, what we want is to have full control on the demand side in a sense that we can almost, you know, have a, you know, constant profile, so to speak, right? So we need to we need to be able to demand to create demand on demand uh, and shed on demands um, whenever we want so that we have somewhat a more predictable in a sense that it's more constant uh, profile. This helps with planning, power, uh, you know, transmission, distribution, and, and all sorts of other good things. Um, otherwise, of course, also, you know, reduce peaks and, and things like that. So the question that we're achieving, what we're trying to go or, or that we, you know, my work focuses on is how do we get to that sort of like almost horizontal profile? And so obviously that's not rocket science. At some point we need to store and we need to control the demand, uh, the, the energy on the demand side, right? So we're talking about uh, individual buildings, not necessarily like a big battery somewhere on the grid. Um, so this is something that you can do it because with storing and, and controlling when you you know st uh, store and release that energy you can get um you can you know potentially achieve these sort of horizontal profiles and and storage can be very generic here right i mean you can talk active storage right or passive um so that's not necessarily exclusive in the context um, a lot of the work i'll show you today is active storage so the thermal or electric battery storage um, but it doesn't mean that you cannot do things like preheat, pre-cool buildings and stuff like that. So it's the same same idea. And then also obviously the control, and that's um, mostly what we're interested in. And so from the very beginning, uh, when I started thinking about this, uh, you know, maybe five, six years ago, <clears throat> when, when I started the lab, in fact, we made more of a conscious decision to you go with sort of like a model free RL approach. And we can debate that. I'm not sure today that would be uh, still the case. So it's more of a philosophical debate. Um, the reason we went down this particular rabbit hole is because I'm, I'm very interested in this sort of, uh, maybe I was, you know, drank the Kool-Aid a bit too much. And it was like, okay, well, how about, you know, you, you don't need to know anything about so many buildings. You can deploy agents and then magically this will happen. Okay, that was the premise of, of what we had. Uh, you know, when you watched AlphaGo, when you see all those Atari games and all of that. So when we stand out, we, we tried to push this and see how far we can go with that. <clears throat> Again, we can discuss this, if this is still true today, or and you'll see that we're moving away a little bit at the end, but that's why we went down this, this sort of rabbit hole. Okay, so RL... Again, not to go too much into detail, right? But generally, it's a formalization of of trial and error, where you try things and you you interact with your environment, and then you get rewards for what you're doing. We as designers, obviously, the reward function is the most critical one, so that you can guide the agent to maximize his accumulated reward over time. Um, and then the the states and the actions are somewhat limited or or determined by what you want to do. That's the actions and what information you have, which are your states. And you can do all kinds of, you know, combinations of these and, and studies and, um, you know, to, to go down, down the, to explore this, right? There is a lot of algorithms out there. The most things that we do today is falls into the, or, or that my group's doing is the soft actor critics, a sort of a, a, a mix between the value and the policy optimization tools or policy iteration tools. Also, we, we did a few experiments very early on and they seem to work the best. So like the best in terms of fastest learning with the fewest data points that we had in this model free world. Um, so that's, we then, you know, decided to just continue down this road. But 
again, that is something that could be debated um, down the road <clears throat> or, you know, moving forward. Okay, so first thing was, okay, this is what we want to do. And then we started looking around. It's like, okay, well, how do we do it? Um, and so that was uh, another sort of rabbit hole because most of the work, this is 2016, 2017, uh, you had to like bite the bullet and do some sort of weird co-simulation and tricks where you take energy plus for the building and then you do some, I don't know, MATLAB interface and there was BCVTB or something. I don't know what it was called that LBNL put together and you, you stitch everything together and then, you know, some thoughts and some prayers that you managed to compile it and then it would work and maybe you get an experiment out of it. It was super brittle. We went through one of those. Um, I really did not like it. And so we tried to go somewhere else. Uh, and, and even if you had done it, you could only still do only one building. So that was, you know, if you multiply that, it just gets even worse and worse. And so we did two things. One thing we did is, well, what do the people do that do study multi-agent RL? Because there, a lot of people did that, you know, like this is five years ago, people in the robotics community, like here's a hundred agents and they do stuff, right? Um, obviously simpler ones, not buildings, but they do so. Okay, so they have this thing called OpenAI Gym that obviously you all heard about. So we let's flip, the, um, let's flip the script a little bit and say, well, what if we wanted to build a simulator that's focused on gym and then simplify everything on the other side so that we can actually do the control and at the same time, you know, not sacrifice too much on the, the building simulation side so that we can actually do the control. So create a building control tool rather than a building simulation tool, which can also do control. Like that's that's kind of like the philosophy behind it for, for how we wanted to build it. And then for space-wise, you can also see from this chart, you know, you can go either one, one direction where you have very detailed building simulation tools where you get into like all the physics and the non-linearities of the physics and how everything is interconnected. And, and in the individual valves, as you can see here, or you can go to the other direction and you can say, well, you know, every building is lumped together for the whole US. And then you just have this one, the generic output, which sure it gives you something, but doesn't give you anything for like a whole neighborhood, let's say like, and we're very interested on neighborhood scale. And so those two things, first of all, that there was no sort of like tool for this you know, 2200 building scale, you know, 500 buildings. Um, and then also there was no gym environment for that led us to, you know, put CityLearn together, um, which in a sense, in the back end, the buildings are simple physics based models, the first principle models, so they're not made up, <laughs> the first principle models uh, for the systems, and we can simulate the demand using an energy class model or using smart meter data or LSTM models to capture some of the dynamics in the most recent version, so I'll talk about that a little bit later, but essentially by not going through the energy plus mode, it simplified us a lot of headaches and still can, you know, provide good enough um, details and what we're interested in in this sort of like range. Um, in the meantime, maybe you've heard, uh, you know, DOE has been pushing Bob test quite a bit uh, at LBNL, they're developing it. This Bob test is a modelic environment. Uh, so very detailed physics. In, with Energy Plus and it runs in the cloud. So it's really cool um, with, with an API uh, to run it. They still can only do one building, but it's very cool. So that's probably where if you really wanna do design and with a very specific uh, guidelines and, and follow some rules, it's probably where the, all of this is going because LBNL is pushing it. But until then, you know, this one is is probably where, where you can explore algorithms basically is what, what we're looking for. There's another one, um, ACTB. Um, this was at, at Boulder, UC Boulder, uh, CU Boulder, sorry, CU Boulder. This is uh, Dr. Hens's group, Advanced Control Testbed is called, um, and that's with NREL and UC Boulder, and this one is LBNL. Um, so this, this, all these two came online like in the last two years. And so that's kind of like just to show that people have done the same thought process a little bit um, to go down and we need this interaction. And there are fewer that are like a gym environment with Energy Plus. Energy Plus has a Python interface now, so you can also stitch that together. So a lot of the things have become a lot easier um, in the meantime. But still, nobody does multiple buildings. <laughs> so here we are. So that's kind of like, you know, how, how things are and where things are right now. And so, Again, what we're doing, like I said, is a gym gym environment. From the beginning, um, we wanted to be able to very generic, you know, every building could have its own thing, his own setup, his own pricing, 
you know, this kind of like flexibility that you can set, um, but without having to worry too much about what goes into it. So you as a designer, you can say this is a residential home um, and it has it has or it doesn't have a PV of this and this size. It has or has not, you know, some sort of storage, thermal electric storage of this and that size. And then it, you know, it does its thing in the background. <clears throat> and like I'll show you, it is pretty generic. So you can use simulation models. You can use smart meter data. Um, of course, if you wanted to do dynamic thermal stuff, it gets a little bit more tricky, uh, but that's what we're working on right now. Uh, but the system size and the demand side given, it's it's fairly straightforward. Um, again, so, so the current focus is on load shifting with active storage. It could be thermal or batteries. Both of them work. And then, yeah, you can focus basically on the algorithms. In the single agent uh, mode, we have a, a link to stable baseline. So, it, you know, you just plug it in and you can run individual buildings or non-interacting buildings uh, with the stable baseline algorithms um, directly. So that that's pretty cool. Multi-agent is a bit tricky because we turned out it was so generic that even our colleagues in, that do robots and multi-agents do not consider this super special case. Um, the, the thing that you that's tricky with buildings, remind yourselves, right, is, um, yeah, if, if you go, let's say, robots, and you talk about robots playing for soccer or, you know, any sort of team, you assume they can communicate in real time and without any constraints. But when you do that in buildings, you're like, yeah, no, that building's not going to share its information, <laughs> uh, right? And it, it's very heterogeneous. There may be in a neighborhood where not everything's connected. So all of these use cases are not captured in the in the current sort of, like, moral world that, that people are developing so that but that's where, where we're kind of going it's also easy to install using pip um, you just pip install it and then you know it follows down and open source so you can you see what it's doing and you can also adapt it however you want um, i'm trying to build you know external people to add um, to it so we're working with folks in montreal in toronto uh, in um, italy torino not toronto <laughs> uh, torino um, and also LBNL to, to make it bigger at this point and add different um, connectivities. Okay. Yeah, go to the website, check it out. Um, this is intentionally small, so you can see what it, you know, what we have built into it, but obviously you can extend it with different observations and actions if you're interested in. So that's that's sort of like the framework. It worked on a long time, spent a long time to, um, you know, make it useful. Um, and, you know, that sucks as a academics because you don't get to publish it. In fact, I still haven't managed to publish a single paper that just says this is it. <laughs> and here's how it works. It was always like, well, this reads more like a software manual. I'm like, yeah, that's what it is. So it's it's tricky, right? The the main paper we have is like a demo on build series. That's a two-page like a poster. So it's not that you know strictly peer-reviewed. But the main the one that describes this, the models behind it is an archive and then I I just dropped the ball to <laughs> actually publish it at this point. Um, but it is there, so you can you can look at what what's in the background. Okay, so that being said, you're like, okay, Zoltan, that's enough with the citadel stuff. What can you do with it? I'm like, okay, cool. So at the end, when it was seemed like that, it turns out to be an interesting tool because I've seen other people use it, you know, for people that I knew and then people that I didn't know. And so we took a step back and said, well, what are the big sort of things that we should be looking at, right? And and so I, I took very very strong inspiration from this paper um, that was available as as also archived like two years before 2021 so it took them a while to go through the publishing process but it, it you know it, it went through like okay rl is really good um it's been around now for you know the 10 15 years in its second sort of iteration alpha go and all of those but it still has not been applied to reality because you know there's still some issues with it mainly you know this this wild exploration is is really a tough one to 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 um, tell people and you know building managers like oh I'm gonna just explore a little bit your building like yeah no you're not gonna do that <laughs> and so that that creates a problem right because you're saying on the one hand you can adapt perfectly to the building but on the other hand you have to explore a lot and but if you cannot explore it then you need to create sort of a model that you can explore but if you create a model then why do you need this why don't you use an mpc so it's it's just like a chicken and egg problem at some point right so one of the bigger questions or one of the bigger challenges c8 here training offline from fixed logs seems to be one that that's reasonable to explore because at the end of the day Buildings are not robots, um, but their buildings, they're running and we know what they do. And, and very often they have some default settings. 
And so the, the appropriate approach to this problem, applying a model-free approach to RL buildings, in my mind, is for any of these systems where you have some settings, is to just use those settings to jumpstart everything, basically. And then you can use uh, model-free approaches to optimize it. We don't know quite if you may reach the actual optimum, so I don't, you know, it's, I don't know if it's provable or not, but you can for sure improve performance with respect to what is in there, right? So this, it goes away from finding the true optimum from knowing nothing to we'll know a little bit. It's pretty not good, but we can improve it automatically. So that's kind of like the, you know, the the approach that I've been taking or thinking about in the last two or three years a little bit. And in, in the RL world, this is called offline learning. So you have a known policy that you learn that, that is given to you and it can be just your past data, a different controller, but it lets you see how actions you know, and, and states are connected um, and how they would lead to a certain um, outcome. So I'm gonna share two experiments um, in this talk, right? The first one is, is based off of this, training offline from fixed logs. There's a whole other set of challenges here that you know we can explore now, but right now we, we I'm, I'm exp I'll, I'll show you this one, um, and then I'll share something with many buildings afterwards. So for this one particular um, uh, one particular challenge, we asked, okay, what if we had rule-based controllers? So those are your your fixed sort of like expert knowledge controllers that are built in. We're, we're controlling a thermal storage system here, and we ask, you know, the, the the goal is when do you charge? When do you discharge? And we say, well normally there's some some default setting we call that like a baseline rbc and it says okay charge at this time discharge at that time and that's kind of like what it does we also did um a, another version where we did a much more complicated decision tree still a rule base so it's a still sort of like a sequence of operation type thing but very very optimized right so if you followed some guidelines how you optimize your system like how it would be and, and you know and in in practice or in this simulation we actually did like a grid search for optimizing the parameters of that tree, of that decision tree. So that's what we, that this were the two RBC uh, baseline or base and then RBC optimal that I will be showing you in one second. And then in both cases, we said, well, if we jumpstart with those, you know, how far do we have to learn? One month, six months or one year, collect data, right? Starting in January, whatever. We learn one month RBC, both of them, and then we we'll switch over to uh, a more advanced algorithm, and then or or we do six months, and then we we'll switch over to an algorithm, or we do one year, and then we we'll switch over to an algorithm. The examples I show you is not learning over and over again; it's one four-year uh, single episode, right? So it's simulating an actual deployment on four years of of data that has actual weather data with it. So so it's not learning it over and over again. <clears throat> Um, okay, so then the, the Marlis algorithm that we use um, for the agents is based on what we developed um, a few years before that, where we had the baselines of the actor critic on the individual buildings. And then what, what happened down here in the boosted tree is each building built their own model of their own sort of like, you know, forecast, demand forecast. So that's based on the data that they collect during operation. So it's not necessarily before, so you don't develop the model before the algorithms are deployed. It's during the operation that you collect the data that you create your sort of regression forecast um, of what the impact of an action would be. So it's limited to know only to the data that you've seen and the regression model that is being built. Um, and with that, what happens is you can then exchange that information in your network. So you can say, okay, next up time step, I plan to use this much kilowatt hours, right? And everybody does that in the queue. And that's what this part here is, an iterative action selection. You queue it a little bit, you you negotiate a little bit around, it's, it's you know, goes a little bit until you decide, okay, this is what we're gonna do. And we can talk about this in detail a little bit more if you want. But that basically that's the idea. So there is some exchange between the next action that the, the buildings try to do. So that's our, Sort of like smart algorithm that we apply um, after we we use the RBCs. We 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 uh, we, we jump started with the RBCs. So here's the results for that, um, and I'm showing you the average daily peak of the um, the average daily peak of the uh, as as one of the KPIs that we looked at. Um, again, one normalized to no control, and then you see. On here, so this is the easy one, the RBC basic. So the very simple one, you see 
no matter how long you train, you improve your results anyway, right? But you don't really need a long time. One month is enough, right? And then you also don't overshoot because you trained enough with the RBC that you will not start to oscillate. You just go down and you improve. It's not perfect, you know, it's not constant, but you improved and it's it's cool. Um, if you learn longer, you presumably achieve at some point similar performance, but it takes you longer, presumably because you learned something that's suboptimal and so kind of like need to forget about it and then improve it over time. And same with same with one year. So this was really cool because again, this was presumably the idea, right? That you could deploy without having to know anything about the building other than collecting the data of its operation when you deployed it, right? So it's not even data from before. It's just started at that deployment. And this is for a thermal storage system. Now, what threw me off, quite honestly, is when you pick the optimized RBC, which was really, really, you know, like a, there was a grid search optimization for all the parameters and what the best parameters are for the RBC. It turns out in this case, the RL, as advanced as it might be, it messed it up, <laughs> at least for this particular um, uh, KPI, right? So the, the peak increased or the average daily peak increased. In this case, because you learned longer, you learned longer to, you actually had better performance if you want to make that claim, it's a bit fishy claim, um, but but that's the only thing in this case. So in either way, a really, really good RBC or sort of like a baseline model outperforms the advanced algorithms here. And of course, we can debate, is it a really good algorithm, how far you get to this baseline? But the point is, you can spend your money on both ends, right? Um, there was a, an interesting paper that just came out by Jane O'Neill um, here from Texas A&M, a few miles north, and they did something very similar where they compared ASHRAE, sort of like optimal sequence of operation for commercial building with an RL algorithm, and they showed almost the exact same thing. The, the optimal sequence of operation for a commercial building outperformed the RL algorithm, right? And so... Now it's a good debate, right? Because you're like, oh, well, why do we need this RL thing now if, if the optimal thing is good enough? Well, yeah, but then you need to get the optimal thing going because that's also not necessarily done, right? So it's it's like, where do you put the money uh, at that point? So this is a very cool result. <clears throat> this is because it shows you can scale easily actually advanced algorithms or apply them. Um, well, easily not, but you don't have the problem that usually people say is like, oh, it needs a lot of data or it does a lot of oscillations. You actually can show that, that you can maintain some sort of normal operations without you know being very, very um, problematic. You can also use the simple rule base or whatever you have as a, as a guideline, like as a safety limit, right? Like you don't put actions that are too far out of some, you know, your, your comfort, comfort zone to some extent. Okay, so that's that. And then the other thing was that we also saw here is that while you can start, you know, comparing KPIs, which are always a bit tricky because, you know, you can kind of cherry pick them. But if you look at the sort of daily operation of the energy systems, none of these at some point made any difference. So like the daily day-to-day -day sort of like the net demand profile was, in, you know, regardless of whether you learned a month or, or a year, at least for this particular application. So this whole debate is really just at the very beginning and then eventually you can, you can forget about it. <clears throat> And we have seen something similar before. So if you really run a long-term, a longer-term simulation, because, you know, buildings, lifetime, like 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. So if you have a year uh, where maybe one method is better than the other, but after that one year, it doesn't really matter anymore. Um, that's also good news, right? Because you can really, like, that's, you know, 10 or, or less than 10% of your time or your anticipated lifespan. So I think that's also pretty good news um, in, in, in sort of like, advanced optimization, online optimize, optimize, uh, optimizers um, for, for us. Okay, so that's one of those. These are the two things that, that we learned, like jumpstarting works pretty well um, with known stuff and less is more. So, you know, you don't have to overdo it, which is good. I mean, there are papers out there that claim model free RL needs, you know, 10 years of data or something. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, no, you don't. Um, even if you don't, do a jumpstart. You don't really need that. It depends really on the problem um, that, that you have and what, what your performance criteria is, right, to some extent. Okay, 
So here's the other example, which, which is not published yet. It's on archive. We're just going through the revision phase. Um, this was in collaboration with EPRI. And this is an example where we used real building data. So this was from their uh, real, so the, the net zero neighborhood demonstrator in, in Fontana, California, that they deployed like some 10 years ago or something. And then they measured and, you know, that's it. They never sort of like, they concluded that the batteries do not add to um, net zero energy or emission reductions significantly. So the, the cost does not, uh, you know, does not, outweigh the benefits or, or the cost outweigh the benefits sorry put it this way so that's a good challenge obviously for a smart system these these homes are built really really um advanced um, but so what we did was we said like i said we can use smart meter data because we only need the demand side right and then we can work with the supply side and shift loads as long as we match this the demand side we can say that you know this would be normal operation of course it's not perfect but it, it's a, a realistic operation or it's not a design, but it's just an operation, right? But basically we took their smart meter data. We also have PV data, and then we they also had uh, storage. So BS, uh, battery storage, sort of like charging, discharging profiles. And so we use that to reverse engineer their own sort of like rules on those. And then we can see what they did and we can compare to that. Um, we augmented with weather data, right? Uh, we augmented with uh, utilities, emission em emission data from um, Southern Edison, I believe. So the hourly profile of how much emissions were in the grid, and then also what the price was for the, uh, for this particular area. And then we, we set up our agents. Um, technically, you can do anything you want again, like we did the RL and we did uh, the rules. And then obviously, you know, baselines, et cetera, et cetera. And then this is a conceptual description, right? Um, the KPIs I spend a lot of time on because this is also something that we tend to underestimate. Um, there are KPIs on the building level, you know, cost, energy, emissions, there are KPIs on a neighborhood level, like the the whole grid, the whole sort of like peak or peak to average ratio if you have, if you add multiple buildings. Um, and, and so, you know, just focusing on one really does not do justice on many of these things, right? And so that that's where, um, you know, if you're biased towards a certain method, you can easily show that your method is better because on some of these KPIs, <laughs> it's performing better and in others, it doesn't. Um, ideally, we can close this loop now. So, you know, and in modern lingo, this could be a digital twin because once you, we would have sort of like an optimized way of, of rules, we could overfit like a decision tree or something and then, you know, feed it back and deploy the actual rules um, onto the buildings. We were not able to do that but it is something that in theory could be done um, relatively easily. Um, and then you could update it again later if you wanted to. So what did we find or we, what did we do? Um, so first of all, okay, here are the buildings. Uh, it's about 17 single family homes built to a very high standard already. So really, really well built. So it's not really a representative of American average homes. Um, you know, there's all like LED lighting in it. There is very high hearse levels, uh, very low hearse levels, I should say, very well insulated um, and so on, right? Built uh, built before 2017. 2017 is a report that came out. So like I said, it's about 10 years old. All right now, solar, PV and electric batteries that they have also EVs, I believe, um, but we did not look at the EV um, at this point. <clears throat> So we had all this, we had some of the metadata, some we had to make up, some of the data was not good, you know, some batteries were not performing as the others, so we kind of like just use the demand side um, and then added the systems, like I said, so we have our, our flexibility um, to work with, but we we kept the system sizes that they had designed, I mean, three, three to four kilowatt peak um, PV systems, and then I think five kilowatt hours uh, battery storage with, I think, two and a half kilowatt peak load, but I, don't, uh, don't, um, you know, nail me on those numbers. Um, so we did a few things. One of the things was sort of like the deployment one, which is just to say, what if we optimize everything for every individual building? What is its own perfect policy, right? We use uh, uh, soft actor critics for individually. These don't interact at all. We, they're just individual right now. And then the reward function is simply, re we, we did a study where we tried to look, you know, costs and emissions, simply because that's what EPRI was interested in. So can you reduce costs and emissions? And then we did, you know, like a, an average and what uh, the exponent should be. And then we ran through a few of these and then we found 
you know, the costs and emissions were pretty related. So we could just go with redu reducing costs and it would result in the same. Um, yeah, we played a little bit just to tell you, and we can look through the paper if you're interested exactly what, what we did. Um, but the, the point was first we established like a baseline, what is the best operation for each of these buildings optimally, you know, based on their own, uh, based on their own operation. And then what we did was we said, well, let's train, you know, just for five months on one building and then transfer what we learned from that building onto every other building and then see how that performance is uh, basically, right? And why we picked five months, we got to pick one month. We just had to pick something. This took took a while and, you know, you have to publish it some point. <laughs> so you could do one, we could five, one year. Uh, it does not matter uh, at some point. But th this is like the scenario, right? Where you have one building, let's say in a neighborhood that you have instrumented, and then maybe later on a new building comes online and how do, what do you deploy in that new building, right? And so that this is the exact scenario. So that new, new building would get this building's uh, agent basically for battery storage control. The, the reference that we used is the time of use tariff because we saw that this is what they used in, in, in those batteries. So you can see it here um, for California, this is Southern California. Um, you know, a different tariff, June, September, and then October, May for, for summer and winter, and then weekend, weekday tariff, again, different. So this is what we called the baseline RBC. And we jumpstart all of our experiments with this guy, right? So that's already, we know that that works, so let's use it, right? And then, like I said, we looked at different KPIs. So electricity consumption from the grid, net cost, emissions, and zero net energy. Again, this one, because Epri was interested to see. This one, because I'm interested to see how far we actually get to true zero net. And that definition itself is tricky because typically you look at it annually, which is a joke. And if you do it hourly, very, very hard. So that's kind of like where the challenge lies, right? Um, and then additionally on a neighborhood or district level, the aggregated daily peak, the aggregated load factor, so the average to peak, a peak to average ratio, and then ramping, which is the difference between two consecutive time steps so that we have like a more constant load profile or, or we would see which of these performs more constantly. So that's kind of like our setup and what is some more stuff, but this is what I'm showing you today. Um, so here you can see the, the KPIs from all of these uh, and for the building level, it's the average of the building. So the top ones here is the average of all the buildings. Uh, the score is average to one here, which is no control, right? Um, and then the, the RBC, which is the time of use controller, you see is always close to one, a little bit over one, only here at the cost it can reduce. And this is what Apri found, right? So you, you really have like 5% reduction on the cost, not, not a big deal. Um, and, and, and you only look at that one, right? Um, and, and so then like, okay, that, that's not really, um, you know, not worth deploying. But then you can look, um, and the, the orange ones are where we individually optimize the buildings. <clears throat> and you see, you can actually get a lot better um, if you optimize. So that, that's the difference between just the baseline control and the more optimized version of the controller, which takes into account more what you actually do in your homes. Um, so all of these buildings are the same, but the people are doing different things. They live differently. If you can optimize for that, you actually can squeeze out quite a bit more. Um, you can see between the orange and the blue, there is some difference, but not a lot. So on average, and I'll show you more detail in a second, but on average, even just learning from one building, deploying on all the other buildings still helps you because eventually you continue your learning and you still continue to adapt to the new building, right? Um, so that's that's really good news here, right? You can deploy in other buildings, you learn, you have advantage. This is based on real data, right? So you can provide savings, which is also good. <clears throat> Carbon emissions. Um, also, we managed to push below one, uh, which again, with the RBC, you couldn't. So that also shows that you can actually use the batteries to reduce uh, your emissions, uh, which is cool. Um, net zero, very tricky. Still, uh, I think we did a monthly average here, but still it's not, not where we would like it to be. The big ones you can see when you average, uh, when you look at it on a neighborhood level, um, the average daily peak, big difference between the time of use, the ramping, big difference, like a huge difference between time of use. This is the one that the utilities might be more interested in because that's when you have to deploy the peaker plants um, in the afternoon, right? And then the load factor, generally not a big, big difference. So first of all, you know, before 
forget about all my results, but what we're advocating is very clear that you have to show a lot of these because if I just pick this one, I'll be like, well, there's no point in this, right? If I pick this one, the ramping, I'll be like, well, you have to do this at all costs. And so the picture is more complicated here, right? And then so that's that's one of the takeaways, I think, that, that we have to show more of these to be more transparent, at least as academics, right? To show that this actually, you you can decide where you put your money depending on what you try to achieve. Um, and, and that's the whole story here. So this is the aggregated one. If you look at it more specifically, this transferring, right? Um, this is a very dense chart very quickly, but you have to focus on two things. So I'll show you, um, you won't see these diamonds, these green diamonds. That's the optimal performance of the building in question. So you optimize building one, you get performance one. Here's the, down here is the chart, right? So um, the, 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 the triangles are the rule-based controller for that building. So the charts I was talking about before is the difference between the two, like the smart controller and diamond, the, the triangle is the, the time of use design. The, green, the gray circles are the results that you get if you use another building's uh, agent and deploy it on building one. Right, so you see, with almost every single agent, anything, every single building in this case, I get better results than the RBC, and that's pretty cool, right? Um, and that's kind of like if you look at all the charts, what you want is that the gray is below the red triangle because that shows that you can transfer the knowledge from any other building into this particular building. And so, if you look at it, um, this is almost always the case. Uh, buildings 12 and 15 are a bit of an outlier. I'll show you in a second why. Um, and seven is tricky, but we haven't figured out why. But in all the other cases, almost every single time, uh, the gray is between, uh, you know, this the diamond and the uh, triangle, which is a pretty cool, um, again, pretty cool uh, solution or pretty cool result. This for electricity demand, you can do it for the cost, um, and you can also do it for the carbon emissions, right? You kind of like get all the time this there are a few exceptions and again this when we go into detail why that is it, it ends up being because of the buildings but but um again generally it, it seems to work reasonably well so it's pretty exciting on this um here's the other thing that i like to show <clears throat> um you know when when you look at the individual sort of like daily profiles for these like these are the 17 buildings like an average load you see the baseline which is the no load which is just the blue or the the, the, the dash line, and then the red, which is the demand you get if you charge with time of use, uh, and then the green is which is what the soft actor critic is doing. So you see immediately soft actor critics a lot more constant, which is that curve that we wanted initially. Um, you also see buildings 12 and 15, there is something fishy with their data, so you can really just discard it. Um, something was off uh, because they're, they're, the, the demand profile focused exactly on the generation and so it was just maybe something wired wrongly anyway so basically you can discard those um but but then the aggregate right again very striking because you start doing this at a scale this battery storage control at a scale you will create bigger peaks at a different time if you do it wrong and so the message here again is that you have to somehow manage these large amount of batteries that we're bringing online if we're bringing them online right <laughs> So that, that will happen. It's the same story as with EVs, right? It's everybody's plugging in at the same time at night, you will get a peak somewhere here. And it's the same kind of thing can happen, right? And so, you know, this is what we're exploring. And so again, what we're taking away from this, um, this can happen, be careful, right? Um, what we can also take away from this part is that you can have an aggregated effect that is beneficial without having to optimize on an aggregated level. And in this case, this happened because each of the buildings have a different demand profile slightly, right? So if you look one through 17, the black curve is different in each of the cases. And so that gives us a little bit of a flexibility um, indirectly that if you're optimizing for those, then on general, you will be okay. So the argument could be made you know, I don't know how, how general this is, but since every building is built the same, this is inherently built into this the occupant behavior. So the argument can be made that we may not have to optimize across many buildings, but we need to optimize individually and monitor what's happening. And so that's kind of like a takeaway, takeaway from this part. 
other than from a technical perspective, if you bring buildings online later, you can add what you've learned before and you know just continue that knowledge, which is also pretty good because it also gets rid immediately of the data intensiveness of the RL approaches. <clears throat> cool. Um, but you have five more minutes. Hopefully that's good. We're okay on time. Um, so, so I mentioned, you know, what's next. So we in the in the back, we're, we're building a more sophisticated version of all of this. So one thing that we'll do is we connect with the DOE's um, end use load profile uh, database. So that way we can generate, and we just submitted a paper on that, like a hundred building, typical buildings from California with typical load profiles. That way we can generalize these results a little bit better and see what, you know, we can, we can pull out, <clears throat> generalize in a design sense. Uh, not not for a particular neighborhood, but this two tiered approach, I think for you know using good simulation models to show what uh, batteries and storage can do and and also demonstrating that you can use tools like city learn for actually as digital twins, right? So we actually learn um, learn the, the the policies and then deploy them. Uh, that that's actually also pretty cool because that will accelerate deployments quite considerably. And then we we extending in two directions. I mean, we like I said, we can do building demand side now, but we're adding LSTMs to this. So we can have like thermostatic control that we can also shift thermal loads. And, and once you can do that, you can integrate um, human performance, human interactions, human preferences, and see how much, you, you know, sort of like demand response and how people react to that and how, whether or not that, you know, uh, reduces, uh, what you would expect from demand response. And on the other scale, um, we work with Kyrie in, in Boulder to add power flow simulations. And so that you can actually say, well, we have batteries, the batteries are on the electric system and they actually can support voltage stabilization with the thermal storage. And that was cool. We need to dig into it a little bit more. Uh, that that particular example had a hundred buildings. Um, and, and, you know, so, so we're trying to extend this with adding more um, functionalities and also more applications, but keeping it in the Python interface so that we don't have to add multiple layers of co-simulation tools, which I don't know, it's not worth it uh, at some point. <laughs> so this way we can look at the interactions, right? And this is how I usually look when I talk about this. But everything is sort of like, you know, all the different tools that, that we have or the knowledge that we have in different communities I've tried to bring together so that we can see how they can interact with each other. All right. And so last two or three slides, um, a lot of work people have used it for different things, which is very cool. Um, I have not, you know, here Meta EMS, they use it to show some Meta RL based on what we showed and you know set it up and, and doing things these guys here used it to say if you fix your you know evaluation budget how far can you get it um others were more applied like here's another another version of you know cloning and then sort of like a transfer learning approach but anyway there's a lot of things going on i think and that's you know what we're trying to encourage because it's a good simulator for any sort of multi-agent approach um that is not easy to, to find out there i think so and then in addition, it helps the building people also to understand what's happening. <clears throat> cool. Um, yeah, I'll skip through that. We did a challenge. If you want to look at the results, uh, we have, it's a whole workshop is, is scheduled. Uh, it's, it's on YouTube. You can, you can take a look. The thing that was cool on this is that um, the first three all had different approaches. The first one was like a complete MPC with a rail kind of like crazy combination. Second place, regression models pure, simple, linear models, linear uh, programming, really good. And the third one was like a handcrafted kind of like fun, fancy stuff. Um, but yeah, the details are there. We just submitted the paper on these so you can you can come out with these. Uh, we do a lot of other stuff, like I mentioned on CCAI and Eclair, and then also BS 2023 will have a tutorial. So we try to get this out into the community now. And we have these RLM workshops. Again, a lot of reinforcement learning for buildings. Um, the last three years, um, also all these are available on, on YouTube if you wanted to see where, where this community is. And generally all of my stuff is on YouTube. So feel free to read and like and subscribe as the young kids say. <laughs> Alrighty, so that's it. Um, thank you for your time. I know I'm rough rushing into five minutes, but these are the, the summary of the takeaways and um, we can have a discussion now. Thank you. Thank you, Zultan. Great talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience? If 
you do, you can go ahead and ask. Uh, you had mentioned, this is Billy Arizunas here. You had mentioned that there was a reason why those two buildings, number seven and number 15, were atypical. Oh, 12 and, and I, 15. That, yeah. yeah. That's what the answer was there. I mean, it, it, they, were not, they were not atypical. They, they were just, their data was not correctly recorded. Um, so I, I, that's what we suspect. We asked EPRI to tell us what's going on with those. They said, we don't know. But if we look at the, the, the actual profiles, the solar generation profile and what is supposed to be the demand is basically on top of each other. And so I, I think that either they wired wrong or they collected it wrong or something. And we knew this was happening. We we still kept them in here just for fun um, to see what you could do with a bad, <laughs> bad, uh, bad sort of data. Cause it's realistic, right? In some sense that you have bad data, but it, that's all. So if you were to, re this data set is available to you if you want. If you were to reuse it for something, I'd suggest remove 12 and 15. Um, Thank you. From your analysis. Thanks, Bill. Any other questions? Yeah, this is uh, Chris Lockman. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I, um, I, I was curious, you know, one of the things that, you, you know, we see sort of looking at the building level is just like more and more interactivity between building components, you know, and I would, mm -hmm. I would, I would expect that you know, the, the operation of the individual controllers within the building, like, like the hierarchies, hierarchy of the building interactions are sort of getting mixed up in some senses. You know, you have more interactivity between components in buildings, mm -hmm. and that means more, you know, interactivity between the building controllers. How do you structure those? So, you know, this is a sort of, you know, it's, it's hard to sort of, it's hard to say, oh, um, you know, I, I can, I know my, controller, you know, the system performance is stiff with respect to the control set points. It really follows right. those quite closely. Um, how, how do you deal with that? You know, I mean, I like what you're doing in terms of saying, okay, let's look at a community level and let's mm -hmm. talk about how to design controls for a community such that the community has good power performance as opposed to hoping that what's good for my building is also good for the community, which it seems like is your sort of take home message. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with these more interactive buildings and components and, you know, all the, you know, um, resilient and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, approaches that are being explored and, and used these days? Mm -hmm. No, that, that's a, I think that's a very good question. Um, first of all, I would differentiate between, you know, commercial buildings and residential because commercial, sure. it's a whole other, yeah. whole other um, problem. I think, so, so my my question, my answer right now is I don't know mm -hmm. um, exactly. So we have not in detail explored it. The, the few versions where we did that, so where we did have, let's say, three agents within a building or two agents within a building, um, we let them loose individually, so independently, right? Mm -hmm. And and what we've seen is that that can work, uh, but you may take longer to learn because you run into the issue of, uh, you know, the the... The, uh, the problem of the mark of property, right? One agent will change the properties of the other agent. Yep. In, in one of our earlier works, um, so, so here's why this, in one of our earlier works, we actually did this where we had three agents in a building and there was a thermal loop in the building and some of the thermal energy came from an agent that would run a solar thermal collector and another agent would run a geothermal heat pump. And so they would collide in the building where they would provide heating to the building, right? Mm. Yep. And and uh, and yeah, they would they would interact like crazy. So we had to kind of like slow them down a little bit. And and um, uh, what we end what ended up working was if the agents were specific to a season, it helped to, with that a little bit. So we, we didn't go more into detail, just mm -hmm. because if again from a philosophical standpoint, right? If you start integrating more and more details, and you might as well just have the whole model. Yeah. Um, and so other than that. Um, we were just trying to see what would actually happen and it didn't seem too bad so or, or bad at all at least in the simulation so we i didn't pursue it further okay. what we try to do now i think what what is even more in or, or in, in the same um in the same scene i'm sorry did I answer your question or do you have yeah, other yeah, i appreciate you know? that yeah yeah the other thoughts that we were having and this was also with chatting with uncles right i mean the ne necessarily we our simulation here can be set up with, let's say, a thermal storage, right? So you'd have electric storage, thermal storage. You can add uh, an EV battery into it, right? 
uh, you can shift thermostats. And so that's certainly where we're going to explore, even in a residential setting, how these things will collide or will not collide, right? I, I think that's mm -hmm. obviously what, what we want to see. Um, and in that sense, the, the objective is how can these agents share the information of the building dynamics because that's actually what happens right and all of them influence it and so if we were to manage to come up with so my my next dream my next dream pipe dream is uh the universal agent that you could deploy on any of these systems right it, is it the ev is it the uh is it the thermal storage electric storage the thermostat you just put them all on um and, and or learn something in a way that you could put them regardless of uh, you know, their, their physics, and then they can basically uh, Im improve the behavior, right? And and I think eventually it may be an overkill, but until then we need to find out how far you can push this without having to do any sort of hierarchical things. Mm -hmm. That That's what I'm trying to see, where, where this sort of like, because um, that I said this in the last thoughts just, but, you know, a lot of people say when you let p things happen, in an environment that's prone to non-linearities, you generate chaos. We just haven't been able to see it yet. Like I would like to see something where, <laughs> oh, something happens and it's just horrible, right? Like you really want to get avoid, uh, you really don't want this because it's really bad. So I would like to push this into that state. Uh, maybe it's a theoretical argument that it may never happen or maybe it can happen very specifically and it just never happens in buildings. But I think that would be a really cool exercise. If, if you have multiple agents in multiple buildings, when when does some some weird situation happen, like the Tacoma Bridge, like it's some weird yeah. oscillation between the buildings, or or does that never happen for some provable reason? So you know that's not going exactly to be exactly because because buildings are not robots, right? I mean they are they have pretty benign dynamics, um, so yeah, maybe that maybe maybe it will never happen, or or very very specifically, yeah. I mean, definitely, like in our in our work in the controls these systems, you can end up with some, you know, poor behavior, and the poor mm -hmm. behavior actually oftentimes is manifested not necessarily in terms of the building performance <clears throat> or the building, you know, the what's observable in the building, but really the equipment performance. Mm -hmm. You know, where you know you have it's really easy to end up with limit cycles. You mm -hmm. know, where you, mm -hmm. you have the compressor like at maximum speed, the minimum speed, maximum speed, and all the valves oscillating, and the mm -hmm. person sitting in the room. You know, this, this actually happens very commonly with a lot of today's equipment across, you know, probably almost all manufacturers, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, and so the performance is not that good. And the equipment lifetime is actually compromised, can be compromised pretty significantly mm -hmm. if you have bad controls. But you're not really seeing that. And so how do you, how do you capture equipment behavior um, requirements into so, this? Yeah. It's, it's yeah. Yeah. It is. I mean, you you can formulate it in that sense that you penalize control actions. I mean, um, there was a work from um, uh, Mario Burgess, it's Carnegie Mellon, mm -hmm. uh, with with Bing Chin Chen, who for a while worked on something similar, and they they had thermostatically controlled loads in neighborhood or in multiple buildings. And they subjected it to, um, you know, cycling constraints. So you they specifically modeled into the to the problem that you will penalize if you oscillate too many times, and that mm. at least helped not to do that. Yeah. And you can do that. I mean, our reward function could implement that. That you can say, yeah. if you did more than one time per day, that you know you you, you get penalized, and yeah. that that's possible. Yeah, that's one way to do it uh, in this framework. Sure. Sure. It's just interesting to think about some of these interactions and then mm -hmm. the implementation uh, implications, you know, like trying to like who implements this and what do they need to implement it? And will the people who need to implement it be okay with that implementation? <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. This is why I like working with the actual data because it also shows it really yep. work. And then we can have that conversation again, right? Because if yep. it's all in simulation, it's like, oh, yeah, of course that works. <laughs> Nobody yep. believes you. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Um, are there any other questions? Oh, Ricardo has a question. Um, mm -hmm. Deep learning systems can be very susceptible to domain shift problems. Have you considered how these RL methods perform under strange conditions compared to a rule-based control, for example, during a severe storm? Yeah. So extreme extreme weather we have not looked at. That is a very good question. Uh, thank you, Ricardo. 
One thing, one thing that we have done, um, and this is, I think, how Ankush, how we met, is so we, we did some work with EMPA where we said, well, you know, we, we can generate synthetic data based on the data that we're collecting. So similar to that internal model that we're building, we can use, and we use GANs, uh, generally adversary networks, to generate a bunch of synthetic data that we could use to, you know, retrain the models. And, and we could show some modest performance improvement in terms of robustness against you know, outliers from what we know. And that was a lot better than the RBCs. So it does work. Um, we, we haven't looked into it more. I think it's a more and more in increasingly interesting topic though, because uh, the application for these batteries and storage systems is not necessarily load shifting day to day, but more like, oh, we have three days power outage. Um, what what do we have to do, <clears throat> and and um, so so it'll be more and more important. So yeah, it's a good question, and, and yeah, we can generate data, but not that extreme um, from from the generated data. Thanks, Ricardo. Mm. Um, all right, I don't think perhaps there are any other questions from the audience. If there are, please go ahead and, and ask. Um, otherwise, I had a couple of questions for you, Zoltan. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'll start with, um, uh, like you, you were talking about net, ze net zero and you were talking about time ranges, which I mm -hmm. find very interesting because mm -hmm. you're right, I agree. I don't think necessarily a month or a year might be the optimal, but mm -hmm. you have kind of some intuition or experience into like, what is a good range to try to achieve net zero on? Oh, that depends who you ask, right? <laughs> the, uh, um, I think, I mean, the reason normally, yeah, the, 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 even if you just Google, cause I tried, I tried to search, like how do you define a net zero building or a net zero community? And, and it's just like, you take everything that you create and you take everything that you use and you subtract, right? Or the opposite. And, uh, and, and typically over a year. So those are the current sort of like running definitions that people use in the design right. area, right? And and so I think, um, so I would be happy if we managed to do it hourly, like if you can do like an hourly sort of like zero, right? So every hour that we use, we can generate ourselves or generate from renewables basically, right? That's, that's kind of like what I think would be cool. Um, until then, it's up to debate, really, what you're looking at. Um, anything, yeah, anything that's so, not anything that's not immediate is a bookkeeping challenge. It's a bookkeeping thing, right? right. So, so, so as long as it's not immediate, and when we have to define what we mean by immediate, like in, in buildings, one hour is typically fine, but I mean, fifteen minutes might be also okay, right? Um, or, or even more challenging, but but. Um, yeah, I have no. Real... I mean, it, 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 to me, it kind of, uh, it, it's like picking a prediction horizon for MPC, right? It's like mm -hmm. if you pick something too long, uh, you know, in this case, if you pick a year, yeah, you have seasonal effects that are kind of helping you out, perhaps. So net zero may not be so right. hard to achieve or uh, exactly. in certain climates. Whereas, and, and... you know, if you pick a short enough horizon, there's too much disturbance on the on the minute by minute basis, and so, yeah, can you? And the implication achieve... is right. The, the implication yeah. is that if if you have so so this is the, comes back to what KPIs we're looking at because if you're going with an annual yeah. load, then from a design perspective, it it incentivizes you to overbuild your PV. Depending on what climate you are, that just means you will burn the PV in the summer and not use it, and then not be able to have enough in the winter, right? And depending on climates, right? But but mm -hmm. but so that's what there's a problem with that. And and so um, you know people started doing um, like when when we worked at Empa, the Hilo module had an insane requirement to avoid this, which is they started weighting the energy that you produce, and you got zero weights for using PV in the summer, basically, and then a lot of weight if you uh, manage to uh, use okay. it in the winter, right? So it becomes yeah, still a bookkeeping problem. But it just yeah. values it just values renewables differently at the time of use, basically, mm -hmm. right? Because because in Switzerland is a heating climate, like right. So you you summer doesn't do much, uh, and then not even electricity wise because you don't need it for heating. I mean, in the winter you need it, but you don't have it. So it, it really was was part of that. Interesting. And you were learning those weights or you were just assigning them? So they were given. So the the, okay. the, the the design requirements to build a nest module where you have to be able to work with this low temperature heating and high temperature cooling supply, and you had to generate a certain energy balance. And that okay. energy balance was a requirement. 
I don't know because it would be cool to going. kind of put that into the outer loop and try and learn those like uh, instead of saying you know let's use PV in the winter it doesn't, doesn't yeah. tell us to use it right right right, okay. right. Uh, you can um, totally do that mm -hmm. cool.